I grew up in the soft hills that overlook the Gudno River Valley in Denmark, from where you probably remember Lego and Hans Christian Andersen's story about the Little Mermaid. I'm just a normal Danish guy. I have three kids. I'm a cultural researcher, but my family is from there, so I belong to a group that has populated this area for a very long time. When I walk out on the fields of my father's farm, I find shards of pottery that were made around the time when there were still emperors in Rome. And uh, they were made by a Nordic people who spoke an ancestor language to Danish that I speak to my kids. That farm was already there. It was just located a bit further towards that edge of the forest that you see there. And I want to tell you about a little animist moment that I experienced a couple of years ago on that land. In fact, on almost exactly the spot where I'm walking there as a little boy. Because of these increasing heat waves, the grass on that field was completely like dry and brown under my feet in a way that I'd never experienced before here in this rainy, humid Nordic region. It was in late July on the day of St. Olaf's Eve. And in the Middle Ages, this St. Olaf had probably come to take the role of Thor, the god of thunder. And in later folklore, we find that this was the time of year where the storage of last year's harvest was typically emptied out, and people would be calling for thunder that they didn't call Thor anymore, but which they believed ripened the new crops. Tradition was to open a specifically made beer in a celebration of gratitude when the first of the new harvest was finally coming in. And as I, as I was standing there on that dry grass, I saw something. Thunder! <laughs> Dark clouds of thunder came rolling towards me over the valley. And I could, like, smell the rain in the air even before it actually arrived to this unnaturally arid land. And it was just that, you know, this simple blessing of rain on St. Olaf's Eve. That was my little moment of hope. Because it was as if I remembered a bit of an ancient insight there, like a glimpse of an ancestral knowledge that we cannot take the world for granted. We have to be in relation with the world. It doesn't just tick away like some huge clockwork, irrespective of how we treat it. We have to call for thunder sometimes to come help us, you know, keep the world in balance. That is traditional knowledge. The knowledge of being in relation with that land. And this is something that we need today. You know, this knowledge of connectivity, which is similar to indigenous knowledge that we find in the culture of Aboriginal Australians and indigenous Americans and Inuit and others. And this kind of knowledge is today being centered in like, culture and research and policy, actually. Indigenous or traditional knowledge was mentioned 590 times in a recent UN climate report. And, uh, and often quoted, like in fact totally overquoted, Australian State of the Environment report claims that 80% of the world's biodiversity remains on the lands of those only 5% of the world's population that are indigenous. If that holds, we could symbolize this relation like this. On a very rough global average, it implies that an indigenous person has 76 times more biodiversity around them than a non-indigenous person. So obviously this astonishing number has made us you know, focus the best of our knowledge, our resources, and our highest scholarship in figuring out how to bring this vast majority of non-indigenous people in that indigenous direction, right? Right? Actually, we haven't really gotten around to that. The general realization that indigenous knowledge is really important, seems to conclude in, and then let us not apply it, at least not for the 95%. And there are reasons for this, like cultural obstacles. For instance, the word indigenous is also a legal term that serves to secure some like access and protection for oppressed minorities. And that's why it's important that majority populations don't start sort of leeching in on that and that's why I talk about traditional knowledge and not indigenous knowledge. And this is just to say that this is not about like white people running around playing at being indigenous. My distinct impression is that 
many indigenous people like much prefer that we refrain from that. Um, but it's also just to say that many indigenous voices also do encourage us to start engaging our own culture in indigenous ways. So in a sense, my idea is just that indigenous knowledge that everybody's talking about, just also applying it also for these 95%. But in order to do that, in order to follow their uh, suggestion and look at our own culture in indigenous ways, we have to understand what it is about this indigenous knowledge that makes these people so enormously less destructive than the rest of us. And obviously there are probably many different reasons, but one particularly strong candidate for an explanation is animism. Okay, so what is animism? Many of the 95% non-indigenous people see the world outside of humanity as a dead material thing that's sort of lying around outside the window, kind of waiting for humans to happen to pop by and make use of it. But many indigenous people are animists. Therefore, they see the world around them as a community of persons that they cultivate like mutually giving relationships with. Often kinship relations, kinship. To many indigenous people, all that biodiversity is family. You know, and that probably has something to do with the fact that they generally want to try and keep it alive. Um, some think of animism as a super spiritual thing, and that's fair enough, uh, but it's not the only way of looking at it. Let me give you an example. You hear that? <laughs> I think many of us, like modern, urban, hipster people, we probably just think, like, bird? But um, have you ever wondered what a bird like that might be saying? <laughs> I once heard that bird in the bush in the western part of Central African Republic, where my wife was born into an animist group called the Baya. And we were walking there with our uncle, and he whistled back at the bird. And they started whistling back and forth, communicating. And I was like, what's going on? Humans mostly don't speak bird. But here's what happened. The bird led him to a hive of wild bees. And as a little payment, he gave it some of this incredibly rich, intense wild honey that you find in an African wilderness. That's animism, that level of being connected to nature. And when we as normal, perhaps white Europeans, look at our own cultural symbols and our cultural heritage, then we can find it. Like when we just scratch the surface a little bit, then it's just below there, that animist kinship bond with the world around us. So let me bring you back to The Little Mermaid, which is one of the best known cultural symbols of Denmark, where I'm from. We know her from Hans Christian Andersen's famous fairy tale. And in this story, the mermaid falls in love with the human prince. But in Andersen's original version, the prince, the human, abandons this bond of love, this family connection with the landscape spirit. We humans deserted this lonely little sea spirit who's sitting there longing for us to return to relation with her. Um, Anderson's story is inspired by older animist stories where the break on the animist kinship makes the sea heartbroken and angry. The sea spirit turns on human communities. It almost sounds a bit like a premonition of these rising sea levels. Listen to this. <clears throat> Den Haumann han lüfter sin heiraten Den Haumann han lüfter sin heiraten Mulma mage over alle land. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Mulma mage over alle land. Such old stories 
they can be warnings, like cautionary tales of rupture in that kinship, that animist glue that keeps the world together. They can also be tales of healing that bond that many indigenous people still practice. And therefore, their indigenous thinking can lend us knowledge and perspectives that we can turn on our own culture and understand how it came to reject this animism that they still practice. I think we need to uh, talk to indigenous people about how to learn from them. Like many of them are reaching out and saying, hey, stuff isn't turning out so well, is it? You know, consider trying to think like this. But I also think that we need a learning dialogue because how to apply this kind of knowledge actually isn't so evident. Like an angry sea spirit that calls dusk and darkness on the lands, eh, it doesn't translate so smoothly into lobbying strategies for influencing policy making on biodiversity protection. So when, for instance, we read the indigenous American scholar Robin Wall Kimmerer, who describes the honorable harvest, this culture of reciprocity and gratitude when receiving food from plants, then let us look for this in our own culture. And then we find that, you know, that there are well-known Danish songs, for instance, that I remember from my upbringing, that describe the tradition of receiving the rye harvest into the farm and greeting the rye as this honored, life-bringing guest. So imagine that, like, Gratitude, in fact, veneration, actually, towards food. Food. I mean, it's, it's actually the stuff that gives us life. You know, imagine that attitude, what that would do to our consumption. Today, food waste is actually a major cause of global warming. It accounts for 8 to 10% of global greenhouse gas emissions. It's worse than airplane traffic. And that's just like one little concrete example that looking in this way at these parts of our own culture can potentially impact the culture of enormous populations and make it less destructive. <sighs> so what I want you to take from here is just that engaging with that kind of culture is available actually to all of us. And if we can learn how to listen with an indigenous ear to our old songs and old stories, then that can lead us back towards that kinship with the land. You know, traditional animist knowledge should not stay restricted with these indigenous people, these 5%. You might say they already get it. You know, it needs to come on the agenda also in the culture of these 95% who has lost it with catastrophic consequences. It needs to come on the agenda in culture, communities, legislation, research, education systems. <clears throat> because that experience of connectivity, it's still there. It's just under the surface in our cultural memory and our old songs and stories. Like I want my children to have some of that experience of connectivity, that the landscape stops being just some dead thing that's just lying around, but that it comes alive with relation. And I want our children to live in communities that reach out towards this sad and lonely little mermaid that we have so carelessly abandoned. Then we can find that kinship with the world that literally keeps the world alive.